Welcome to Patients at Risk, a discussion of the dangers that patients face when physicians are replaced with non-physician practitioners. I'm Dr. Rebecca Bernard, and I'm joined today by my co-host and the co-author of our book, Patients at Risk, The Rise of the Nurse Practitioner and Physician Assistant in Healthcare, Dr. Naran Al-Ajba. Good evening. In our last episode, we discussed the rapid growth of nurse practitioner training programs and some of the challenges that is caught this has caused in ensuring that nurse practitioner graduates receive adequate clinical training to care for patients. Today, we will continue to explore concerns about nurse practitioner quality of education, as well as a new trend for nurse practitioners to seek work in cash pay type practices, including opening medi spas, infusion centers, marijuana, medical marijuana clinics, and so on. To help us explore these issues, we are joined again today by Rain Toman. She's a registered nurse and she's working to expose unethical nurse practitioner training and practice. Rain, thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you. Rain, over the last few months, you've been working to shed light on the deficiencies in nurse practitioner training by posting on social media. Can you tell us you know, how, why it has come to this and why you're on this mission? Well, there's a lot of denial, I think, from some people that this is happening. And it's also, I mean, a major patient safety issue. And if people don't know this is happening, how can they protect themselves? You're exactly, you're exactly right. And, and you're right. People don't always believe it. And so that's why we have to show them proof with their own two eyes. And that's exactly what you've been doing. And so for today's discussion, what I'd like us to do is look at some of these posts, discuss them, and try to get to the bottom of why we're seeing this. And you've actually categorized what you're seeing into nine separate categories. Um, educational confession slash school reviews, which we talked a little bit about in our last podcast. Um, preceptors or lack thereof, which also we did cover in our last section. So let's move into the next category that you call clinical questions. And the idea of these posts is to show the public the type of questions that nurse practitioners are asking in online forums, then it really sheds light on the educational quality concerns. And so much, in fact, as we mentioned, the American Association of Nurse Practitioners has asked nurse practitioners and students not to post on social media, but they're still doing this. And we have loads of examples to look at together. Well, it's become a culture at this point, too. I mean, this has just become normal. And I don't think people understand that this is not normal, like this is not acceptable. One of the things all. that I like that you do, Rain, is that a lot of times you'll post the question and then you'll also include a confirmation that the person that's posting it is actually a nurse practitioner or an NP student. And usually you'll have a, a picture of them with, a, you know, they're holding their diploma or something. Because one of the accusations is that these aren't real yeah. nurse practitioners or real students. These are just, um, trolls Fake. and they're making it up to make us these bad. doctors are going in the groups and no these are real people these right. are licensed real people they're not doctors pretending like yeah right. that's that yeah that's how that kind of started it's like here's the evidence no this is all unfortunately very true so one of the posts that we have here that we'll put up is hi does anyone have a good chart or research for blood pressure meds specifically when to use each drug like are calcium channel blockers better for this condition and etc thanks in advance my farm class was kind of a bust and the response from one person was well i just googled hypertension algorithms the other day and found something so hypertension is kind of a core primary care bread and butter. So if, they're, if we're having trouble learning about managing hypertension, that sounds, that's pretty scary. And uh, then there's one, can you explain to me how to prescribe oral steroids? I am brand new and I'm in allergy and rheumatology. So a brand new nurse practitioner working in two specialty fields, I don't even know how that's possible. And asking yeah. about using steroids, which are very commonly used in both of those um, specialties and saying tapering is confusing and I feel nervous every time I prescribe outside of a Medrol dose pack. Well, I guess you should feel nervous because you don't know what you're doing. You know well, what I find fascinating? Steroid medications are probably one of the most dangerous medications to use without experience. And again, I'm a pediatrician, so we're talking about you know, for specific uses, whether it's an inflammatory condition or asthma. But again, I see so many, I mean, I've watched a kid die because someone gave them weekly steroids for a cough they had when they were laying down. 
and a, and a anterior mediastinal mass got missed and she died. I was doing chest compressions on her literally and she died. And I've never forgotten it. It's impacted me and how I practice for 20 to 25 years. And I'll never forget when I've been talked to about steroids over the years by mentors. It's like, you do not mess around with these. You think about infection because you could kill someone. You think about what you're missing. It's not just they're coughing, give them a, give them a Medrol pack. And, and so, I, sorry, that one really has, has a, triggered me a little bit just because I have watched children die from misuse of steroids. When you see a cavalier discussion of, of potentially life-threatening medications, you do get upset. Because I do, that, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I do too. And the problem is that we've discussed before, if you've never really seen anything bad happen, you don't even think about it. It's, that's one of the reasons why we spend all these years and we see all these awful things that we, we need to confront so that we're really careful and we really think through our decisions of whether or not a medication is truly appropriate. We have to weigh the risks and the benefits. So as I mentioned, a lot of times we get told that, well, these posts are just fake. Nobody's that uh, uneducated coming out and practicing. Well, here's some proof that Rain posted. And one of the things that she does is she finds cases of board complaints against nurse practitioners. And she posted one recently in which a nurse practitioner prescribed a patient, the patient had hyperthyroidism. So their thyroid was going too fast. And instead of treating it appropriately, the nurse practitioner prescribed a thyroid replacement medicine. They actually gave them additional thyroid medicine on top of the fact that their thyroid was already going fast. And as it's pointed out here is that they delayed care because they misinterpreted lab results and fa failed to recognize an incongruent patient presentation and made the wrong diagnosis. So something that we would consider in medicine, you know, in primary care, really straightforward, much less endocrinology, the difference between a thyroid that's going too fast and a thyroid that's going too slow and when you give medication and when maybe you refer to someone else. And you know, again, I'm sorry, I gotta jump in because my dad was an endocrinologist. He would be having a literal heart attack right now simply because um, you know, it's it's not just a thyroid that's too fast or too slow, right? There's the pituitary gland, there's the hypothalamus, there's all these higher level functioning. And so a kid, I mean, I've had two children now with thyroid being off and a different child with growth hormone being off. And of course, before we scan the head, which is a standard, very knowledgeable thing, both ended up with tumors in their oh brain. So again, it's not even the thyroid. I mean, like here we are just talking about this person who just the person had a thyroid problem. You have to think about the other couple layers and places where there's a problem. But if you don't learn these things, you don't even know. Right. Right. Rain is works in psychiatry. So I know that you're really passionate about the care for uh, vulnerable patients with mental illness and psychiatric health problems. And that's one of the things that we're seeing a lot of posts about because there's a, what they refer to as a mass exodus from family nurse practice, which it has traditionally been the most common type of nurse practitioner and more are choosing to go into psychiatric and mental health nurse practice. Rain, what's your take on why so many nurse practitioners are seeking psychiatric certification? Well, because the family nurse practitioners can't find jobs. I even saw that in my program, you know, and they don't have any psych experience. And I think some of them genuinely do, you know, they do say, well, you know, I, I've seen a lot of psych, you know, when I was working primary care, there's a need. Okay, I can appreciate that, but you still should probably work in psychiatry before you do it. Like nurse practitioner, it's a foundation. Like you're supposed to have nursing experience and psychiatry is so specialized, but they, these schools just let them in and you know and they make a lot more money that's the other thing there's job security but now they're oversaturating the market like well that's one of the things that that was on some of the posts that you shared where um a lot of people are speculating that this to go into psych is a very well compensated field and in mm -hmm. fact we'll share the screenshot of this advertisement for a youtube video that's promoting people to choose psychiatric and it says get paid more than a doctor as a psych nurse practitioner. So there's definitely a push towards going into psychiatry mm -hmm. because it's more lucrative and because maybe there are more jobs in that market. Yeah, they don't even hide it. <laughs> and it's really sad because then, you know, we some of the posts that you've shared from psych 
fields is just, it breaks my heart. Like there was one that you shared that actually got the attention of a senator, a state senator out in Washington. Um, do you have that in front of you to share that information? If not, I can read it out. It, yeah, I, I, I know which one it is. Yeah, because somebody tagged her in there. Yeah, so this was a this was a person, was Yale. A, a Yale graduate, psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, and you linked to her that she's there she is. And here's what she said. 18 year old female with depression starting at age 11 suicide attempt at age 16 reports anxiety and depression worsening since starting college. And then she goes on to describe what sounds like a manic episode and also says that the patient overdosed on lamotrigine that she, the nurse practitioner prescribed at the first visit. So this is a high risk patient. And so the uh, nurse practitioner says, I have her down as rule out bipolar disorder. She was just discharged from the hospital yesterday. I plan to see her within the week. How would you proceed? I'm thinking lithium, but I'm worried about her overdosing on it. I just don't even know how to respond to something like that. This is a, a young woman who's already attempted suicide twice and to treat, she's being treated by a psychiatric nurse practitioner who's asking how to treat her on Facebook. From well, and also there's this point, like a medication is her problem. If we could just change the medication, we can fix the problem. And I think it's demonstrating a real misunderstanding of what the problem is and the layer upon layer of issues that are going on. There's family stressors. There's, you know, probably, again, this isn't my area of expertise, but probably some depression, probably some more long-term, what we call dysthymic, which is just a really low mood or low energy. I mean, there's so many things I could say about this one paragraph. And it's not as simple as just put someone on lithium to fix it or band-aid no, the problem. Not at all. And so what I love that happened here is rain really made an impact because someone else saw this and they wrote, well, I looked up this person on her website and I found out that there's no supervising physician for her. Yeah. So what's going on? And rain says that's because it's an independent practice state. And so someone tagged the state senator and said, this is why practicing medicine without a medical license is dangerous. And if you do it, don't even try to outsource it on Facebook. And so Patty Cooterer is her name. She wrote, I read it and I'm engaged. She asked to, to be contacted via her, um, her government email and says, thanks for reaching out. So Rain, I think that this is the type of example that gets attention because it shows right. how egregious this type of, of treatment is and how dangerous it could be. And this could be your daughter, your sister, uh, your child. This is not good. And this is somebody that graduated from Yale. Thank you. And, and this is not a years diploma of experience. mill. That's a good four point too. Of experience. That's why, you know, this is very real. Like that, you know, people, have, I've had comments like, oh, you're putting people's names. Well, we're all licensed, right? We right. all, uh, that's all public information. It also makes this abundantly clear how real this is. These are real people. This especially, is real. especially in Washington where I'm at, of course. And, you know, two of the cases that you've pointed out, number one, this one in Washington state. And then of course, um, uh, Jay Baltz is also practicing telehealth in Washington state. Yeah. And I did send uh, Senator Kuderer a copy of our book. And so to follow up on the work you're doing, Rain, um, as well. So uh, I did send that off, I think, last week or whenever, probably within a couple of days after you had, um, had done this and pointed this out. And again, I just think this education is so important because we're very willy-nilly. Washington State is extremely underserved for psychiatric um, care. Uh, a lot of us have done different pilot projects to try to help expand it, but the the it's being flooded with um, these psychiatric nurse practitioners who are just kind of throwing medications at people. Right, and I think the the you know you see a lot of child psych ones too, and I think it's because they don't have the preparation that. I mean, a physician has to do, it's a two year fellowship, right? It's not one year, it's two years for child adolescent psych, correct? Well, they, they do four years of psychiatry right. and then they have to do another then, one to two years extra yeah, of child. I think it's And two. sometimes three, depending on the program. So yeah, even so, so some of them are Five, six, up to seven years after medical school, not a hundred hours. <laughs> exactly, like, and I'm told, you know, cause people post on these posts, they're like most psychiatrists will not even touch child and adult, you know, adolescent, even though they do have the training in that four-year residency. And I actually looked up because they do do like six months. It depends on the program. I looked up residencies because I was curious. 
So they have more, a psychiatrist has more training than a psych NP and they don't even want to do this because yes, they know it's dangerous no. and, li- and yeah. high liability. Right. And they don't want to harm anybody. Exactly. They, you know, that's why we have child and adolescent psychiatrists and Right. And so these are the types of cases that they're seeing, like here's some more. Uh, One nurse practitioner is talking about one of her patients that's a 10 year old boy who threatened to shoot students and teachers at his middle school and says the father wants meds. What should I start him on? Uh, This is a potential Columbine shooter we're talking about. I mean, I don't I don't want to make it sound overly dramatic, but this is a person who's threatened to to shoot someone at school. It could just be an idle threat, but you've got the treatment as saying what should what meds should i start them on and you're asking facebook well he's a danger to like others that's usually exactly (gasps) well and again this is highly unusual so when you think of how many children actually threaten i mean again i know the media makes it seem very common but when you have a child of this age threatening to shoot someone at school that you need to take seriously and that yes. actually probably needs, that child needs help. They need yes. to get in with a psychiatrist. They need to have a full workup to keep the public safe. I, I don't know how else to say that. I mean, this is f- so frightening that this is going on and being ignored and someone's asking Facebook how to treat them. Yeah, and the same right. MP says, 12 year old coming to the ER with signs and symptoms of depression, cut her forearm the night before. Boyfriend broke up with her, bullied at school. New to meds, should I start low dose Zoloft or fluoxetine? Peds is new to my practice. Any advice? You have a, a young girl, a, a girl, I think it is, a young person who's cutting, cutting herself and high risk for potential suicide or self harm. And you're asking Facebook what meds to start. I well, as if the don't... meds are going to solve your problem. I just want to be really clear here. Like, to be honest with you, in my experience, meds do not solve either of these problems. I cannot emphasize enough how much a low-dose Soloft or Prozac, which is what the nurse practitioner is asking, I, I literally cannot emphasize enough that medication, either of them will not solve the problem because neither of these cases are solvable with medication. Right. They need intense therapy. They need, yeah. they need a sec- they need a they they need need intervention. A lot. They need support. They, they need, need more intensive- than asking Facebook. Yeah. Right. So like, it's really I mean, just- a, a disservice. And, and, you know, we can just go on and on. I mean, there's another case with a, a, a really a seven-year-old child with what sounds like post-traumatic stress, possible sexual abuse uh, with psychotic oh. type features. And they're, the, the nurse practitioner is listing all these different psychiatric meds that they've tried and saying, uh, any other thoughts on what I should do? And this is just not the way that we take care of patients. And, and it's not just children that are affected. There's someone else asking questions about how to medically manage a pregnant woman. Uh, another one asking how to medically manage an 80 year old with anxiety and insomnia and saying, can I start her on Xanax one milligram at bedtime? Would that be okay? That is like a mega high dose of a controlled substance, a sleeping pill that could be enough to really make an 80 year old not wake up again, especially if you're mixing it with a bunch of other things. I just read these and in it, my heart sinks when I see them. So uh, that's some of the things that Rain has been uh, you know, keeping us up at night with. <laughs> but actually, it's, it's really important because we need to know that this is what's happening. And let's transition into another aspect of what we're seeing online. And that is the search for the cash-based practice or the non-traditional practice or the alternative medicine practice. And we're seeing a lot of that, right, Rain? Yeah, I mean, there's groups devoted to, you know, side hustles and nurse business and elite nurse practitioner groups, and they're encouraging one another, which to me, that's more alarming than anything, because, okay, you're always going to have people that want to act this way, right? Physicians do these things, like, let's let's be honest, they do. You guys don't have groups, like, you kind of go rogue and go do whatever shady thing, right? You're not all, you know, this is like, they're teaching one another. They're encouraging it. They're creating courses. It's like, yeah, this is not what healthcare is. I think the elite nurse practitioner group is one of the most interesting examples of this. And you've shared quite a few posts from that group, but just, I mean, it's, it's not secret to go on to the elite nurse practitioner and their symbol has a dollar sign for the S in nurse. And the website, it says, it has a mission of increasing the professional and personal freedoms of NPs across the country. 
And this was founded by Justin Allen. He is a family nurse practitioner with a master's degree in nursing. And he talks in his blogs about how he, he really recommends that everyone have multiple jobs, multiple side hustles, as you call it, Rain. And he says, for example, that he's been really resilient with COVID because he says, quote, my telemedicine practice exploded in growth my men's health practice continued its slow and steady growth and my medical cannabis clinic remained the same. And so he's doing all these different types of practices. And so he's created a curriculum and for three, $400 per course, you too can learn how to start your very own telemedicine practice course, your men's health testosterone course. You could take the stem cell and regenerative injection clinic course, medical cannabis, IV infusion clinic, and I think one that's a fun one, the advanced clinical peptide treatment course. So there are all these different complementary types of practice that he's advocating. And one of the things that he says in his blogs, that reason that he advises this is he says, these are cash-based practices. And so you're able to actually make a lot of money and you don't have to worry about billing Medicare because Medicare doesn't cover these kinds of services anyways. And he has a book and of course he sells his ads. I mean, he sells his courses as well. And so the elite nurse practitioner is a really interesting place to see a lot of posts where nurse practitioners are discussing this back and forth. And what you're seeing a lot of is um, what should I do? How can I make money? And one person says that, you know, hey, you know what you should do is you should look for niche, niches and for p- patients that are underserved like uh, LGBTQ, LGBTQT patients. Um, you should look for patients that have mental health problems that, you know, it's cash-based practice. And when I read this, I get so sad because I really see disenfranchised patients, vulnerable patients that are potentially going to be victimized or at a minimum get ripped off for some of these uh, treatments that are not necessarily evidence-based or safe, necessarily safe or effective. Well, and if I may add, I'm reading, I'm looking at where um, the elite nurse practitioner says, you know, I require labs before every appointment, it's my, or before the appointment, it's my policy. Um, You don't want patients who question you, trust me, uh, they'll make your life hell. Um, You have a policy, just follow it. If they don't like it, they can go somewhere else. And, And what's even more fascinating is the Washington State Medical Board did a sweep of the state and every single physician at all doing any um, testosterone clinics, growth hormone clinics, things like that about vitality and health, they removed the licenses of all of them. Wow. And it it expanded into Pennsylvania. I've done a lot of research on the medical board for other reasons, and it expanded into Pennsylvania because some of these docs were working back and forth and collaborating. They have all now have a black mark on their record and have been pulled for, you know, they're in, they're unable to practice. And yet it's going on in Washington state, right? It's going on because if you're a nurse practitioner, you can do these testosterone growth hormone clinics and nobody's going to oversee that or pull your license. So to me, that's really been a frustration because some of these docs will tell you this is how I was doing it. No one has died. You know, I was following this protocol. This is the science behind it. And what's interesting is if you're a nurse practitioner, you can just do it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, It it worries me because number one, a lot of what they're doing is not evidence-based and it's just really um, for making money. And for two, because we've been sold the nurse practitioner and physician assistant profession as one that was created to fill the gap of the supposed physician shortage and to reach underserved patients and to provide primary care. And of course, nobody these days is that interested in doing that kind of work because it's really hard, because it requires a lot of dedication and study and because it's not always as well compensated and there's a lot of challenges with documentation and getting compensated for your work. So I get all that, but the answer is not just pursuing these cash practices and letting nurse practitioners do them autonomously. So some of the posts that I have here there's just so many nurse practitioners that say that they want to go into aesthetics. That's the big thing. Don't, don't you see that a lot rain? Yeah. I mean, I think I post tweeted three of those today. Yeah. Everybody like wants to do that. I mean, who are all these women going to these med spas? Like there's one around the corner for me actually. And it is, it's a nurse practitioner. She owns it. And, you know, I mean, you see this, it's not just, you're seeing it on social media. It's, it's, it's everywhere. Real. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's not just the aesthetic. So you've got, you know, your Botox and selling different products for cosmetic appearance, but also what you're seeing is people that are getting into areas like IV therapy. And that's something that I worry about a lot because they say, well, it's no big deal. You just put an IV in somebody and give them this cocktail of vitamins and fluids. And, you know, anytime you do a medical intervention to someone, there are risks involved. I have a patient that received a lot of antibiotic IV therapy for his Lyme disease, supposed Lyme disease chronic, and his veins are so scarred now that you can't even draw blood on him because of all this IV antibiotic that went into him. And so here's a person that posted on the elite nurse practitioner group saying, I just finished the IV course and I was wondering if someone could help me with an IM question that's intramuscular. We are not quite ready to start IV therapy, but we want to op offer some IM options while we get ready. Which ones would you give besides B complex? And someone wrote, well, you can give glutathione. Uh, it's supposed to be given IV, but you can give it IM. It just burns a little. She didn't mention the dose she uses, but it, it can be done. So, I mean, this is just talking about doing things that you really don't even understand. It's really just a matter of you trying to make money and you don't even necessarily know how to do it. And I think that's so dangerous and it's so um, just egregious on so many levels. Uh, and then lots of people looking for IV hydration. It is a big thing. And in fact, what's happening is some of these nurse practitioners are hiring nurses to run the clinic. So, you know, used to have physicians hiring nurse practitioners. Now you have nurse practitioners hiring nurses. And in fact, Rain, you posted a board sanction of uh, a nurse practitioner who owned a clinic called the Drip Nurse in Dripping Springs, Texas. And that nurse practitioner was accused of having the registered nurse administer intravenous and injectable nutritional and vitamin supplements uh, without even really evaluating the patients. So again, just merely being done for money making and not being done uh, really under supervision as it's supposed to be. So right. I'm and I think his, it's interesting in those complaints to read some of their rebuttals to this. like. And I read it and I'm like, they really said this to the board of nursing? I mean, because I believe his was, I, I have to look at it. He said it's vitamins, intravenous vitamins are an emerging industry and believes there's no prescriptions required for intravenous and injectable vitamins because consumers may order over the counter and self-administer. I mean, it's amazing. He said this to them like, oh, well, people can go and buy over the counter vitamins and inject themselves with them. So this is okay. What? Like, yeah, it makes no sense. And this is this yeah, practitioner like, who owns this clinic. I like how you put a picture of him and you've got a screenshot from his website. And it says, thanks to Jonathan's extensive education, he has experience in the following areas, sports therapy with Olympic and professional athletes. So somehow that gives them credentials then I guess to administer intravenous vitamins and, and therapies to patients. Well, he's a chiropractor too. So I, I mean. Oh, I didn't oh, even hello. see that. Oh, you're right. He yeah. Is. Oh my yeah, he's a chiropractor. You didn't see that. I mean, and was he even a registered nurse really for, I mean, it says but, he was. Yeah, it says. I it, mean, but... it says registered nurse, nurse practitioner for three years for a pain care physicians. I mean, I don't know. Like, yeah. cause I would think. I, I, you know, you want to give somebody the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he didn't know because he didn't have nursing experience that you can't leave a registered the, nurse. What was the complaint about? Just out of curiosity. I mean, it was it a patient who complained? Uh, you know, they don't say who complained. It could have been the, the registered nurse because Got it. It, they don't say this one didn't. Sometimes they do, but in Texas, they don't. Well, the other thing, you know, although maybe intravenous vitamins, you know, don't have a huge risk of harm, but I'll tell you something that does, and that is testosterone therapy. We had a Dr. Amy Townsend on discussing the case of Kevin Morgan, a nurse practitioner who lost his license after uh, uh, being accused of causing the deaths of two patients and harm to seven others by inappropriately prescribing testosterone. And yet you've got people on these online forums talking about testosterone as if it's an innocent and harmless product people saying, hey, I have, I need a little help. I have a transgender patient that has been off of medicine and now wants to restart. I'm unsure of the dosing as I have never done this before. So of course they go on Facebook to ask on the elite nurse practitioner instead of doing some research and learning how to appropriately treat. 
And so there's another question about testosterone where they're asking, they're more interested in knowing how do you charge for it? And also for weight loss and the elite nurse practitioner answers and says, well, I charge off of the duration that they purchase. If they come in for injections or want to do home supply, then, and they're on a monthly recurring pay payment, then I charge them $129 a month. If they want to buy three to 12 months in bulk, then I discount it. The high rollers buy the bulk deal. Everyone else is mostly on the recurring payment. So I can't imagine giving someone 12 months of testosterone bulk. Um, that, that would not be considered appropriate that, that as far as I know, because you need to monitor testosterone, you need to monitor levels. And so I would be pretty concerned about that. But, you know, again, they're looking at a lot of the financial benefit. And then we're also seeing questions about, can you, we open a medical marijuana dispensary? And then one of the big things I'm seeing in my area is ketamine or ketamine clinics, which is a, an anesthetic medication that is being used now. It's been approved to treat depression in some cases. And these are popping up all over the place. And the elite nurse practitioner says, yes, this is a very lucrative practice to start for a nurse practitioner and they recommend it. And someone says, well, do you have to be a psychiatric nurse practitioner? And someone says, uh, no, you can be a family nurse practitioner. It's not outside of your scope. And ketamine is, again, in this case, it's being used as an anesthetic. So you might have a, 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 an anesthesiologist using it, or in this case, it's for depression. So it would be, you would think a psychiatric specialist, psychiatrist, ideally, but instead you have all sorts of nurse practitioners, including family nurse practitioners, um, ordering and, and treating patients with ketamine, which is generally safe and well tolerated for the right patients, but can have very serious and life-threatening side effects for some. So really dangerous stuff. And then I think it's very interesting that he's doing a uh, advanced clinical peptide treatment course. And uh, Noran, you kind of alluded to this. This is like growth hormone and something that they, they call like wellness hormones. And then there's just a slew of them. It's and this thing of vitality. You know, it's this idea, like, let's give you some performance enhancement. Let's add some testosterone, throw some growth hormone on there. And I love that he says the best part about peptides, it's a cash, it's safe and provides significant results. And the safe part, I'm, I'm with Rain on this one. Like, I wonder who these people are that are paying so much money to, to get all these hormones and things that haven't been proven. And the fact that it flies under the radar of the medical board and the nursing board to me is is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and, it, and I think as more people die, obviously it's going to become a more popular thing. So I, I do think many cash practices have not been successful. I do live in an underserved area and many of these have kind of, people have tried to do them and they haven't done well. So I'm with Rain wondering like, who has all this money to pay for these unproven treatments and how are these nurse practitioners generating this cash cow? I think there are a lot of desperate people that are seeking to feel better they're, and they're looking for anything. You know, I had a patient that unfortunately didn't do well. He, he was severely depressed and he went to a wellness type center where they said, oh, we think that you might have a parasite and that's why you're not well. So we need to give you antiparasitics and we need to give you all these supplements and IV therapies. And he actually did really poorly and had a very bad outcome after he sought that level of care instead of going towards a more you know, appropriate medical care that maybe would have helped him, but he was looking for help. He was looking for answers. And I think I worry for patients that are being preyed upon. This isn't just about vitality. This is also the patients that have serious medical problems or serious psychological problems, and they're just looking to feel better and they'll do anything and they'll pay any amount. And we need to make sure that they're not taken advantage of, you know, like one of the, th you mentioned about, you know, uh, the boards taking, coming down on this, it's starting to happen. Rain posted a, a, a screenshot of someone asking, has anyone used amniotic fluid trigger point injections or joint injections? I mean, I, I wouldn't even, even imagine something like this. And is there an issue with right. that? And uh, then Rain posted a board sanction of a nurse practitioner who had been practicing for like one month, I think, and then performed an experimental procedure using human placental tissue that she injected into a patient's lower back. And in response to that, she said that uh, she thought it was okay because she gave other kinds of trigger point injections. So, you know, why not do uh, amniotic fluid injections? 
And then another one doing something like that with a human umbilical stem cells. So this is popping up everywhere. The board, some of the boards are sanctioning it, but I'm sure a lot of it is slipping under the radar. Until the boards are sanctioning it, we have rain to um, <laughs> help keep us abreast of what's going on because <laughs> you're, you're like a, a one woman dynamo finding these these cases and people I, and I think, send me them like that's wow. the thing like you're like because when we, person. <laughs> well when I got on those message boards when I was still in school you know I found other like-minded people and you know there's we would send them to each other every day like oh my god look at this or you know you know and it kind you know, so other people send me them but Rain, have you gotten a lot of, of pushback or uh, had been bullied or been mistreated because of speaking out? Well, it's funny because the last one we just posted, the, the amniotic one, that was a while ago. But I remember somebody like, and I, I, it was a nurse practitioner, jumped on there and was like, you're, you're, you're exaggerating. Like, they didn't really do that. Doctors inject amniotic fluid. And, you know, yeah, some people, they're not, yeah, they get, I get crazy messages sometimes. Um, somebody posted a background check that they paid for me on me a few weeks ago that was lovely i mean yeah yeah naran and i get a lot of that too we, we've yeah. been we've been thoroughly investigated and vetted and fortunately we seem to have come out relatively unscathed i think if you is if you speak the truth people will look for ways to punish you for that and that's why you know try to hold we try to hold ourselves as, as carefully as we can knowing that we all mess up we've all made mistakes but we're just trying the best that we can to ensure that patients get safe and effective treatment and you deserve a lot of credit for that rain. I mean, I figure even if one patient across the country per day sees your posts and sees uh, what you're exposing and what you're trying to do, um, I think you're saving lives. So honestly, to me, that's that's really incredible. Hopefully, and thank you. I, I it's I don't even think it's hopefully. I think it's happening because I think yeah. I think it's really important. No one's saying don't go see a nurse practitioner, right? No. no one's saying don't go see a PA. We don't feel that way. What we're saying is know who you're seeing and know what their expertise is. And I think you're showing there's this kind of loosey goosey approach to this expertise, and it's not regulated. And so you are saving lives. In in my in my opinion, there's no doubt. Thank you yeah. so much for joining us awesome. again. And thank you all for listening. We encourage you to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen. It's called Patients at Risk. And also to our YouTube channel, we encourage you to get our book, Patients at Risk, The Rise of the Nurse Practitioner and Physician Assistant in Healthcare, available at Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And if you're a physician and you're interested in learning more about this, visit us at physiciansforpatientprotection.org. Thank you, Rain Toman, so much for joining us. Rain, you. you're my hero. I'm dead serious. <laughs> and we'll hope to have you back for more exciting discussions and interesting topics. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time.